Welcome to the Spine Guy. I'm Dr. Brian Sue, a fellowship trained spine surgeon in Marin, California. The Spine Guy is a channel dedicated to making the complex spine simple for patients to understand. Today we'll be talking about the cervical spine or neck, as well as what your doctor might show you on a cervical x-ray or an MRI scan of the cervical spine. I'll be posting new videos weekly, so hit the subscribe button to catch them as they come out. The cervical spine or neck is what holds and connects your head to your thoracic spine. So this is the cervical spine, and this is the base of the skull, back of the neck, front of the neck. So if you were looking at my spine, you'd be looking at it from the side like this. Cervical simply means neck, and in the cervical spine, you have the base of the skull, which is here, we call it the occiput, that's basically the, the back of the, um, the back of the skull, which contains your brain. And then you have bones and you have discs. The bones are the building blocks of the spine and the bones are named by number. The first bone of the cervical spine is called C1. C is for cervical one because it's the first cervical bone. And the C1 bone is an interesting bone. It's a ring or an arch. And I'll try to show it to you this way. So this is the C1 bone. And the C1 bone sits on top of the C2 bone or second vertebra. And the reason the C1, C2 bones are interesting is because the C1 bone rotates on top of C2. And it does so through a long bone of C2. The C2 is a little peg and the C1 bone rotates around the C2 bone. For that reason, many patients ask me, if you have a cervical fusion, do you maintain any sort of motion? Interestingly, you can fuse the entire cervical spine, leave C1, C2 open, and you'll still maintain 50% of your range of motion from right left. Same goes for the base of the skull or occiput in C1. You'll see that the occiput in C1 also have this little, what's called the OC joint or occipital cervical joint, and if you fuse the entire spine but leave the occipital cervical joint open, you'll still be able to move 50%. The other bones are very straightforward in the neck other than the C1, C2. The other bones just count by number. C3, C4, C5, C6, and C7. The discs are the cushion between the bone. And these are the discs. The disc is like a jelly donut. There's a hard donut outside and a soft jelly inside. And that cushion or disc in between allows the bones to move on top of each other. So when you flex forward or when you extend your neck backwards, everything is moving across the disc in the front of the spine. Now discs over time, by definition, degenerate, they get flat, they get uh, arthritic, and sometimes those bone spurs can pinch a nerve, and that's sometimes what causes a pinched nerve. Some discs can also rupture, called disc herniations, and those disc herniations can hit a nerve and that would cause arm pain. In the front of the cervical spine, the bones are connected by discs. In the back of the cervical spine, the bones are connected by what's called facet joints. The facet joints are these little joints here that are in between each bone. The facet joint is an actual joint, just like your knee joints, your joint. There is cartilage inside the joint, there's joint fluid. So when you move back and forth, the cervical facet joints in the back allow your spine to flex forward and backwards. So again, the cervical spine is moving in the front by discs and the back by the cervical facet joints. Cervical facets themselves can cause quite a bit of uh, pain. It's called uh, cervical facetogenic pain, and we'll certainly review that in, a, in another episode. There are a couple of different neural structures, things connected to the brain that the cervical spine carries. So here you'll see kind of the base of the brain, which is the brain stem, and this yellow thing in back is the spinal cord. And you'll see the spinal cord is located inside the cervical spine, and the cervical spine is what protects the spinal cord. The spinal cord is obviously really important. It carries all the signals down from your brain through your cervical spine. When somebody becomes a paraplegic, it's because they've severed something at the cervical spine level. So the purpose of the cervical spine is really to protect this uh, large thing inside, which is the spinal cord. And you'll notice that there are also nerves that come down and these nerves come off the spinal cord and each nerve does something different. 
when people get a pinched nerve in their neck, uh, they start getting arm pain depending on which nerve is being pinched. So the things we're going to look at in an MRI are the spinal cord and the nerves from a, from a neural structure standpoint. The first thing we get before the MRI are x-rays. The reason x-rays are important is because just like the lumbar spine, a cervical MRI is done where you're laying flat on your back, there's no gravity. Well, people's posture change with gravity. So that's why we always start with x-rays of the neck. There's a few different x-rays that we get. Um, a typical series of an x-ray would involve an, an AP, meaning a picture from the front to back. It'll involve a lateral, which means a picture from the side. It'll involve a lateral flexion, which is a picture from the side with the patient lean forward. And the lateral extension, meaning a picture from the side with the patient extended backwards. And the purpose of this is really to look at stability of the bones. Here's an example first of a lateral. This is the side view here. And an AP, which is the front back. The AP is of somewhat limited utility because the AP or front back is really used to look at scoliosis or abnormal curvature. Abnormal curvature in the cervical spine is very, very rare. The side view or lateral uh, really is a little bit more important and telling. This is exactly what you're looking at. So this is the base of the skull here, and that's this. There's the jaw. We obviously don't have the jaw in this model, but there are bones and discs. So the bones here show up as white, and you can see what I was talking about, C2. There's that kind of long peg, and this is the outline of C1 that sits around it. Um, the bones are named by number, so C2, C is cervical, C2, C3, C4, C5, C6. The discs are named by the bones that sandwich it, so the disc shows up as this clear space, which is dark. Um, this is a C2-3 disc, C3-4, C4-5, C5-6. No such thing as the C2 disc, it's C2-3 because the C2 and C3 bones sandwich the C2 disc. The other thing you'll see is the facet joints, and you can see them back here. And again, the bones show up as white, so this is the entire C3 bone. There's the vertebral body, and that's the facet, and the joint itself is that dark line. The joint shows up as dark because there's fluid there, and anything that's not bone shows up as dark, and anything that's bone shows up as white. First thing we want to look at is the curvature to the neck, uh, which is called lordosis. Uh, lordosis is a good thing, and most patients should have a lordotic neck that's nice and curved upwards. This patient, you can see, has a little bit of a straight neck. We call that loss of lordosis. Next, we're going to look at the flexion extension view. So what you'll see here is this is a patient putting their chin down. And this is the same patient. There's the back of their neck. You can see the soft tissue shadow. There's the jaw. These are the bones here, C2, C3, C4, C5, C6. And really what I'm looking for is the bones to be all aligned. And some patients, those bones, when you flex forward, can be out of alignment. This is the extension view, and you can actually see that on extension, this patient can achieve pretty good lordosis, which is a curvature in the neck. Of course, they're trying to look up towards the sky, but this makes me know that this patient can at least achieve lordosis. Once we get an x-ray, the next thing we most commonly get is an MRI. An MRI doesn't have radiation. An MRI is when you go into a small tube and a magnet is used to look at the soft tissue. An MRI can look at bones, ligaments, um, and for what we do, we're really looking at the spinal cord as well as the nerves, and it gives you a much more in-depth view of the cervical spine. So this is a cervical MRI. There are two very basic views that you're gonna be shown. The first view is from the side. We call it the sagittal view. That's on the left-hand side here of the screen. And on the right-hand side is called the axial view, which is an end-on view. And, and both views are gonna be clear uh, in a second once I explain. So this is the side view. This is probably the easiest one to understand. So this is looking from the side. So again, this is the back of the skull, back of the neck. There's a front of the neck. The jaw would be here. The jaw was uh, cut off in this series, but essentially a slice through the center of the spine. So it's as if we were to cut the spine this way and open it up like a book looking on the inside. So here's the back of the skull 
And obviously we have the bones. So there's C2, once again, C2 is that big peg. C2, C3, C4, C5, C6, C7. There are seven cervical bones. The first thoracic bone is called T1, and that's where the first rib attaches. Um, the bones here show up as white, that's on an MRI, or gray. And the discs are, once again, like jelly donuts. This is a fairly normal looking cervical MRI that I've pulled up. You can see the jelly inside is kind of light. The dark donut layer is this dark layer. Um, and this is the C2-3 disc, C3-4, C4-5, 5-6-6-7. Maybe there are a little bit of disc bulges down here, C5-6 and 6-7, but really pretty normal. Here's the base of the brain stem, and there's a spinal cord coming down. The spinal cord is a solid structure. Uh, again, as I showed you last time, the spinal cord is this solid structure that's yellow in back here. And this is the view of the entire cord. The spinal cord is attached to the brain stem, and around the spinal cord is fluid. So there's something called cerebral spinal fluid, or CSF. And there's cerebral spinal fluid is what the spinal cord bathes itself in. And the lumbar spine, there's no spinal cord. The spinal cord typically stops at T12L1 or L1L2. So in the, in the lumbar spine, if you watch the lumbar spine episode, these are just little strands of nerves coming down. In the cervical spine, it is a solid cord, which is why sometimes compression of the spinal cord can be very dangerous because the spinal cord has nowhere to go. This white stripe here really is the fluid that's surrounding the cord, and the more fluid, the better. This is really a normal amount of fluid around the spinal cord, um, and there's no obvious spinal cord compression whatsoever. We can go back and forth on the sagittal view, um, and here's a good example of taking that line that we've cut through the middle and moving it back and forth and if you move it to one side or the other you can essentially take a slice across the facets and you're looking at a side view of the actual facet joints so here you can actually see the facet bones this is the c3 c4 c5 c6 facet and this is the facet joint in the back here a pinched nerve is one of the most common things that we see in the cervical spine. So if this is the side view. What this view is, is called the axial. So what that means is we can essentially pretend like you're taking a knife and cutting this way, looking on cross section and laying flat like that. So now on this picture, this is the base of the skull or occiput down here. Your face is up here. This is the right side. And this is the left side. So this is as if the doctor is standing at the foot of the bed looking from bottom up on cross section. So we can look at every different level. So you'll see here there's a red line. And I can in fact move that red line up and down. So we can start at the very top. So this is if we were to section C23 and look on a cross section. And you'll see that as I move the red line down, this changes because we're looking at the cross section at every level. So this is the cross section at C34, cross section at C45, and I did blow up the cross section here, which is the cross section at C56. So let's look at this cross section here. So again, if you can see here, the cross section of a tube looks like a circle, and this really is a solid, uh, should be solid. And here you can see it's solid. So there's a spinal cord on cross section, that gray thing. Because it's this tube on cross section, the spinal fluid you can see around it, which is this white stuff. When, so if you have spinal cord compression, then you would obviously disappear into this white stuff. Here's another good uh, schematic of what this axial looks like. So if this is the side view and we're to cut here, this is looking like this from bottom up. So in this model, you don't have the spinal cord, but the spinal cord sits here, and that's what this thing is. Now, to look at the nerves, the nerves come off of the spinal cord. I'll go back to this model. You can see these nerves are these yellow things coming off the cord, and they come out these location called the foramen, and sometimes you'll see a term called foramenal stenosis. Stenosis is just a fancy word for narrowing. Foramen is the location of the narrowing. So if you look carefully, this is actually the foramen right here. And you can see the nerve, which is this gray thing, come off of the scalp spinal cord out. 
You may be wondering what these two little things are. Those are the vertebral arteries. Those are these things right here. Those are not neural structures. Those are vascular structures of blood vessels that go to the brain. And so those are the basics of reading a cervical x-ray and an MRI. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to click the like button and leave questions or feedback in the comment box below. Feel free to let me know what videos you'd like to see in the future.